Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, where the URL is too complicated, so just look up Virtual Memories Show. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week, the Virtual Memories Show. Now, I've got a crazy week ahead. Um, I'm doing my first ever congressional testimony on Capitol Hill on Wednesday. I've got a trade show back up in New Jersey on Thursday, and then the Small Press Expo outside of Washington uh, on Friday. I've got a few podcasts lined up for SPX, but I'm going to try to bug out early on Sunday so that I can get back up to New Jersey uh, so I can get to the town of Clinton in time for the opening reception for Joe Chardiello's art exhibition Spaghetti Journal at the Hunterdon Art Museum. Uh, Joe was on the show a few months ago, and we talked about this project. I absolutely love Joe's illustrations, and I'm awfully glad he's getting to show off some of this series. Um, you can find out more about it at joechardello.tumblr.com. Chardello is C-I-A-R-D-I-E-L-L-O. You can also go to hunterdenartmuseum.org. Uh, the opening reception is September 17th at 2 p.m. That's 2017 for those of you listening in the future. Um, and I hope to see some of you guys there. But the big non-podcast thing, obviously, is the congressional stuff. Um, that's for a negotiation I was involved in this summer, which came to a somewhat satisfying conclusion on Friday, um, which is good because if I had not reached an agreement with the other party, I was going to have to give some kind of confrontational testimony uh, to this congressional panel and potentially take some tough questions. Um, so I'm glad it got resolved. Um, no one's super happy, but everybody's, um, equally at ease with the result, I think. Um, still the thing is I got the official invite, uh, late on Friday for a hearing on Wednesday and I've never done this before. I need the reps. So I'm, I'm down with doing this. Uh, I'm not necessarily, well, not needed there now that we've gotten this agreement, um, but it is a good opportunity for me. It's a good opportunity for my association. The downside is there is a whole bunch of paperwork involved in giving testimony. And given my Kafkaesque fear of bureaucracy, there is a strong chance this is going to be the final episode of the podcast and that I'm going to be executed at high noon on Wednesday for filling out forms incorrectly. Maybe not. I'll probably try and take some Xanax beforehand to make sure I'm I'm at ease. I think I've got the forms filled out right. I'll check with counsel. But uh, anyway, let's get to the show. This week is a, a double episode. I recorded it at ReaderCon, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Festival up in Quincy, Mass. last July. Um, our first guest is the writer Liz Hand, or Elizabeth Hand, depending on how formal you are with her. Uh, I asked Liz to drop in and just give me a quick, so, who are you reading? for the Fear of a Square Planet patron-only podcast I mentioned earlier. But we ended up going kind of long, and it was a really fun conversation. By long, I mean like 15 minutes. Um, but it was long enough that I thought I'd include it in this episode instead so everybody gets to hear it. Now, after Liz, we've got a return conversation with John Clute, the guy behind the science fiction encyclopedia and easily one of the smartest people I've met through the podcast. Uh, both John and Liz have been on the show twice already, so they get to join Michael Durda and the Three Timers Club. And I'm staying with Clute in uh, London in October after a trade show that I've got in uh, Germany that month. And so it's a possibility he'll become the first four-timer on the show. We'll see. Now, here's Liz's bio. 
Elizabeth Hand flunked out of college a couple of years after seeing Patti Smith perform and became involved in the nascent punk scenes in D.C. and New York. From 1979 to 1986, she worked at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. She was eventually readmitted to university to study cultural anthropology and received her B.A. She's the author of many novels, including Winterlong, Waking the Moon, Glimmering, Mortal Love, Illyria, and Radiant Days, as well as three collections of stories, including Saffron and Brimstone. Her fiction has received the Nebula, World Fantasy, Mythopoeic, Tip Tree, and International Horror Guild Awards, and her novels have been chosen as notable books by both the New York Times and the Washington Post. She's also the author of the Cass Neary series of novels, which I adore the heck out of. She's been awarded the Maine Arts Commission Fellowship and is a regular contributor to the Washington Post Book World and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. She lives with her family on the coast of Maine. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Liz Hand. Anyway, so what have you been working on? What's been going on? I have. You know, that new little book, Fire, that just came out, um, which is mostly a compendium. There's one original story in it. And working, kind of struggling to finish the fourth cast book. The, you know, the ending keeps receding. It's, you know, it's a paradox. It's just the closer I get. But I am now at the point where I'm maybe 50, 50 pages from the end. So I'm See, hoping when I get home to kind of, before the end of the month, to finish it. I had that when I... Um, <coughs> When I I went to go see Howard Chaikin, I, I drove. I landed in L.A. and I drove out to Ventura. And the closer I got, Google Maps kept giving me a longer and longer yeah. time to get there. So right. yeah, it was it was. I can understand, except in my case, it was just sitting behind the wheel of a car yeah, as opposed to actually it's creating art. So. so I've rewritten it a bunch of times. I've done several thorough revisions. I'm hoping at this point that except for the last 50 or so pages, I won't have to revise the whole thing again, but we'll see what happens. Do you get any sort of creative vibe or recharge from attending something like ReaderCon? Yeah, I definitely do. Yeah, if I hadn't been... Um, I, I just came off of my teaching residency. I, I teach an MFA program, and I was there until, you know, I mean, I, I got home one Tuesday night, did unpack, did my laundry Wednesday, and then left early Thursday to come here. So I got pretty uh, adrenalized by that, mm -hmm. you know, the teaching thing, which is great. I mean, it's, it's not dissimilar to here being, you know, with the faculty or all these wonderful writers from different backgrounds and different, you know, uh, literary, uh, you know, sources, poetry, creative nonfiction, quote unquote, literary fiction, popular fiction environmental writing, screenplays. So the faculty is great, and I always really enjoy seeing them. And the students are wonderful. So it's, you know, getting to read their stuff and, you know, hear various presentations and seminars and listen to the other faculty writers read. So that's really exciting. And then I take a day to not really quite recover <laughs> and come here. So it's like being shot out of one cannon and then being shot out of another one. But, yeah, it's great. I mean, my favorite part of being a reader, kind of, I have to say, is probably sitting around at breakfast with various writer yeah. friends and people who, some of whom maybe I haven't seen in a year or longer, and everybody just kind of hangs around and talks, mm -hmm. and you know, it's fun. But then, yeah, going and hearing the various readings. Heard Chip Delaney, uh, Delaney read today at noon. And that was great. And uh, was it one that was going to scandalize people, like some of Chip's uh, no, stuff, or was it more? It more, was about uh, Spinoza. It was, oh it yeah, was, yeah, the yeah. atheist in the attic. Yeah, the, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And there was a little bit in there about cannibalism, so that was. Yeah, but that's all things just, considered. That's, that's exactly, mild as that far as Chip just, goes. Yeah, yeah, that was just in passing. So um, yeah, so and I've been on you know several panels. I'm going to be. Um, moderating a panel shortly on Shirley Jackson. And, uh, yeah, it's it's great. It's fun. It's, it, it is tiring. I have to say, the older I get, I get more, you know, physically tired yeah. by it. So I'm not able to, like, stay up until the wee hours and hang out at the bar and drink the way that once I was able to. But that's probably for the best uh, yeah. in general. But, yeah, so it, it's uh, it's great. It's always good to be here. Always good to see you. Oh. Jeez. You know. <laughs> okay, I'm the invisible man. You know that. But what are you reading? What have you been uh, well doing of late? 
I well, I just got while I was here. Yeah, in I'll fact, what are you picking for, up at ReaderCon? Too. I got you know John Crowley's Ka. Mm -hmm. She, I, I got a copy of the galley of that, the Ark, um, and I picked up in the book room today, um, uh, posthumously published uh, collect the collected stories of Susan Casper, mm -hmm. which is called Up the Rainbow. Um, Susan died, which was way too young. Um, and uh, this was, the stories were collected and edited by her husband, Gardner Dozois. So mm -hmm. I got that in a little chapbook of, of Susan's work. So I'm looking forward to reading that. And um, in addition to, you know, all my student manuscripts and their theses, uh, I recently read a book, a really wonderful book that came out, I think, in 2015, came out in the UK originally by, uh, it's called The Loney, L-O-N-E-Y. It's by Andrew Michael Hurley, who's a, a British writer. And it's this incredible book. And it's actually got kind of an incredible backstory because it's um, a supernatural novel or supernaturally tinged novel that's really about place. It's, for, it's about Morecambe Bay, which is this area of northwest England, I think just south of the, the Lakes District. I've never been there, but now having read The Loney, I feel like I've been there. And it's a book about two brothers and and them being, you know, at this annual religious retreat, um, you know, a Christian denomination, uh, a religious retreat at a house in um, Morecambe Bay and strange things happen and it's this really beautiful eerie book and at the end of it you know I you know you're kind of like wow what happened it was sort of sort of like a Robert Aikman uh short story in which it's all so much mood and atmosphere and this just sort of feeling of encroaching dread but anyway it was really it was excellent you know, one of the best supernatural novels I've read in many years and it was originally published by Tartarus Press, which is a small press that in the UK that specializes in, um, you know, works that are sort of in the, in the vein of the classic English ghost story, like uh, Arthur Mackin or Algernon Blackwood and um, people like that. So anyway, it was published by Tartarus Press in uh, an edition of only 278 copies. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> it ended up winning the Costa Award, which yeah. is a big, Award yeah. in the UK for um, I think it's the best uh, British debut novel. So it won the Costa Award, and then it also received the award from the British Publishing Association for the best debut novel. So all of a sudden, this book by somebody who was unknown that came out in this little tiny print run um, kind of exploded, and it got these great reviews. It was written up all over. So anyway, I had I was a little late to that particular party. It came out in twenty. 15 and I got it or, you know, and, and you know just finished it recently and it was great I really I loved it I highly recommend it and then I just a couple of nights ago finished reading um, Josh Mallerman's Black Mad Wheel which I, I had not read his first book Bird Box which got very good reviews and again it's another um, uh, sort of story of terror it's set in the 1950s it's a a group of kind of an improbable setup, but it's a group of um, World War II vets who are young, and before they went over to fight, uh, they were members of a band in Detroit. Or maybe actually, maybe they did. I think they did know each other beforehand. Anyway, they go to the war. They're part of the army band. They come back to. Detroit, and they, you know, get the band back together. The band is called the Danes. And um, then they're tapped by uh, an American intelligence agency that says, we want you to go to um, the desert in Africa. And there's this very strange sound there. And the sound is killing people. And not only is the sound killing people, it's dismantling uh, the military's, uh, our weapons, our weapons of mass destruction. Not the term they use, but that's what yeah. they're referring to. So they get this motley crew together and they send them to, um, to the desert and they start ex trying to track down the source of the sound. 
and they first, you know, they hear it. It's the, he plays them, the guy who recruits them to do this, um, he plays them a recording of it in a within the studio and uh, where they're where they're working, and it's one of these. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, the build-up, the lead-up is really, I, I thought, the, the creepiest part of the book because it's just you don't know what this, the source of this sound is going to be. So they go there and they, and they you know, start tracking it down. And you know it's something terrible because the book, there's no spoiler here, the book opens with the protagonist, the central character. Um, he's in the hospital recovering, and he's basically had every single bone, yeah. everything in his body just completely shattered. But he has somehow managed to survive. So it, it it goes back and forth between him and the hospital, not really remembering what happened, trying to piece it together, while the doctors are trying to piece him back together. And then the Danes trekking through um, the desert trying to find the source of the sound. And the author, Josh Mellerman, is um, also the uh, lead singer of a Detroit band called The High Strung. So he brings this sort of background of the music industry into, into it as well. So, uh, yeah, so I, I highly recommend those two books, and I'm very much looking forward to reading Susan Casper's stories and uh, John Crowley's. I ah. shudder to ask, have you, um, have you read the show That Never Ends, the nonfiction oh, book yeah, about yeah, the history the book of Prague? About Prague? Yeah. yeah. You've read it? or, or you're, <laughs> Yeah, you're I ha- I'm like okay. halfway through it. Cool. I, yeah, I'm okay. reading it. Yeah, I got a... I kind of figured it would be up your alley. Yeah, but, yeah. I got a David Weigel. Yeah, I, I got a copy of that book, and I um, I didn't set it down because I didn't like it. I, it just, I had other yeah, things re- reviewing and reading yeah. commitments, so I set it aside. Yeah, so whenever I have time, I pick it up again. Yeah, what a great book. I love the opening. I haven't what seen it, it yet. Oh, yeah, That's the thing. It? I, it was one of the, uh, we're supposed to get together a few weeks ago, oh, but yeah. my DC schedule isn't great. He's traveling a lot, so I figured, yeah, you know, we set oh, something no, was, up, we'll sit down and read it. It was really fun. Yeah, I was, and you know, when, when I was in high school, I was a huge Prague fan. Yeah. It was one of the things about the book he was saying, you know, women tended not to be into this, but I was like really into it. Oh, I know the one female Rush fan, you so know? it's okay. You know? So <laughs> it was, I was really into all that stuff. The first concert I ever saw in the city or anywhere was Nectar, and then the second one was Genesis. Uh, I think it was the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway tour at the old um, Academy of Music down So you're still getting the Peter Gabriel Genesis. Yeah, Peter point. Gabriel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not talking the other Genesis. I don't yeah, I mean, I, a later I, day, I like, but yeah, yeah, I don't do that. No, this is I definitely you, Peter Gabriel. Um, as far as horrible first concerts go, Asia. Oh, was, it, in keeping with prog rock, that's, yeah. There was a guy just in the hall that had an Asia shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been ironic because, yeah, you know, we're uh, here. But Yeah, anyway, really, that was, it's a really fun book. And the opening chapter about the, uh, Weigel going on... The Yes Cruise. It's one of these (laughs) themes. It's a prog rock theme cruise. And that was great. That was worth the price of admission. (laughs) I I emailed a friend of mine uh, who's a... uh, a big yes fan, somebody who I've known for decades. And I, I was like, did you know this existed? He was like, oh, yeah, everybody knows about that. <laughs> everybody knows about the Prague Rock <laughs> tour, cruise. Awesome. Now, let me ask one weird question before you run off to, to moderate. You mentioned the um, oh, the, the, the uh, Black Mad Wheel, the how the, the, the buildup and the dread is, is the big thing. How difficult is the payoff? As a writer, to pull off, yeah. When you when you build a really good mood, it's tough, you know. And some, uh, yeah. yeah, sometimes you get to the you know. I I know as a writer and also as a reader, a critical reader. Um, I mean, as a reader, I just want to be entertained. Yeah. But having you know taught and and worked as a critic and reviewer for so many years, it's impossible now for me to turn off that part of my brain. And so often, yeah, the end of books of of um, you know, dread, tales of terror, horror, whatever, supernatural stories. Sometimes they don't pay off. It's hard to do. I, I think it's actually shorter works of, um, you know, supernatural fiction. The novella, I have always believed, is the ideal form for mm-hmm. it. And I think some of the greatest uh, novellas are written. In, I mean, some of the greatest, you know, novels, uh, short novels of horror, or dark uh, fiction, our novellas, you know, The Turn of the Screw and Heart of Darkness, Oliver Onion's The Beckoning Fair One. Um, it, it's just, it, it's long enough that you can get in characterization and you could really build, you know, a sense of atmosphere and tension and dread. But 
you can basically read it in one sitting. Because if you're reading a long book, even if it's Stephen King, even if it's whoever, you know, great writer of horror, every time you put that book down, you're breaking that spell. Mm -hmm. And so you have to pick the book up again and basically, you know, the writer has to be able to cast the spell all over again. And then you have to, you know, it's sort of, it has to keep building and building and building and building to this crescendo at the end. Where, ah! um, and with a, with novellas, it's much easier to do that. You're not breaking the spell because somebody can ideally read it in one sitting. And you're able to build to the payoff um, without having to string it out over too many pages. Which, again, builds up a, yeah. an undeliverable promise, exactly. I guess, if it's 400 pages versus 60. Yeah. So. so I think that works well. And, and that's the form I like to write in the best. And, and I think it works the best for that kind of fiction that I do. Flip side question. When someone tells you, I read it over the course of an evening, does it ever hit you that I spent two and a half years on that book and you only spent, you know, Oh no. Okay. It's still a good sign if, no, if they yeah, completely devour it. <laughs> some of those, some of those novellas, I, you know, I wrote in only three weeks. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you're reading it in an evening, that's good. Cause like they tend to be when I'm doing them, I write them at white heat mm. and, um, and, and they are, I think some of them are quite successful. I mean, I'm saying that not just based on my own opinion, but on, you know, reader reception yeah. and other things that they, I know that they work. I know other things that I've done don't work so well, but the novellas I think do work. Um, so I do, I try to, um, I try to get as much as I can into those, whatever it is, 17,000 words, 18,000 words, uh, however many pages that amounts to. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I ideally want people to read it in one sitting. That's how I like to read that kind of stuff. You know, you sit there ideally in front of the fire on a cold night with the wind howling outside, the wood stove, you know, and the wolves slavering at the door. And <laughs> <laughs> you make Maine sound so appealing. That's it great. is. It's well. It's the ideal place to, you know, to read tales of terror. Sounds good. Liz Hand, go moderate. I really enjoy the time. Thanks for, Thank you, uh, for sitting down. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And that was Liz Hand. Her website is elizabethhand.com, just like it sounds. And her most recent books are Hard Light, the third of her Cass Neary novels, which are fantastic, and Fire from the Outspoken Authors series. I just love those Castaneri books. Um, also, I haven't read Liz's other work, but she is pretty much worshipped among the, the reader con crowd, so I'm betting her other novels and stories are really good, too. As it turned out, I bumped into the guy wearing the Asia t-shirt that evening. Uh, he wasn't wearing it ironically. Uh, we, we bonded over the fact that I saw Asia on the Alpha Tour when I was like 12, so he knew I wasn't busting his balls too much when I called him out for wearing an Asia shirt. Now, our next guest is John Clute. Uh, we got together because he just gave the inaugural lecture for the John Clute Science Fiction Library, which will be part of the Telluride Institute in Colorado. John's the editor of the Science Fiction Encyclopedia, a, I believe, well, as of July, 5.4 million word project. Uh, we get into the, well, the whole encyclopedic mission during this conversation, as we've talked about in past ones. As I mentioned, John's been on before, uh, but I always enjoy talking to him, even when he gets so theoretical that I don't really know what he's talking about. But he humors me, or I'm a good actor. Anyway, the big caveat with this one is that I screwed up. Um, I did not start the primary recorder on time, and it's been a long time since I've done that. Uh, I noticed about 15 minutes into the episode, so the uh, first part you're going to be able to tell is from my backup recorder. Uh, then we seg into the new one and we joke about my incompetence. Sorry. Here's John's bio. John Clute is a multiple Hugo Award and World Fantasy Award winner and visiting fellow at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, England. He is perhaps best known for his editorship with David Langford and others of the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, found at sf-encyclopedia.com. As an illustrious and prolific reviewer and essayist, he has profoundly influenced science fiction writing in his time. And now, a virtual memories conversation with John Clute. So tell me about Telluride. You gave a, the, the library is, is not open, open, but you gave a speech as part of the opening ceremony. 
Like well, in a, in a word, you've described it almost completely. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it was more than one word. But we, <laughs> the Telluride idea was originally an idea simply to pass on to the Institute or to a, to a non-profit constructed specifically to hold the library, an archival library hmm. that um, John Lifton and Pamela Zoline had long indicated to me that if I were going to dispose of it, they wished to think about um, housing it there in Telluride as part of the ongoing Telluride mix, which is a bit lower on culture and on archival establishments than it perhaps should be, given its aspirations to be a, a central tiny urban town on the western slope of the Rockies where culture can be glorified, um, extemporized upon, um, skied down, and retained. So the library itself is, is a small marker of, of what you might call um, temporal stability, because it's a first edition library that focuses, as most research libraries do not, on the visual presentation and accessibility of the original texts in the original context. I've been doing quite a bit on Facebook about um, the British Library and its stripping of dust jackets, describing that as a form of enforced cultural amnesia and devastatingly damaging to our popular culture, but not only our popular culture, the, the whole tissue, the whole tissue of context for written literature is programmatically dissevered from, from the books themselves. That context is ripped away from the books. The books are presented stripped naked, like their skins are torn off, when you present a book as basically a resource. Yeah. That uh, you extract uh, a from, repository of information. And that you don't have to actually see the book to extract the information. Yeah. And I think, basically, it is a great technological convenience for many, many people, myself included, to be able to extract information from a book without actually seeing the book itself. But ultimately, we should be able to go back to that context. We should see the dust jacket. We should see the original edition. We should see where that book appears in the sequence of that author's work. We should be able to extract knowledge that is deeper than tears, as it were. We can't quite explain what it is we're getting, but we know we're getting something. And fantastic as a whole, as a, as a pattern of, of texts that, are, that jostle with and are constantly impacted by the surrounding world, is exactly the kind of genre where it is hugely devastating to strip context. So the library is small. It'll be 12,000 volumes when it's complete. The library itself is an embedded, embedded context, an argument of embedded context. And in that sense, it's transgressive, because most scholars, most academic institutions, libraries are not interested in context. The MLA is specifically not interested in context, although it, apparently it is gaining a tad of maturity in recent years, but it's only very, very reluctantly and grudgingly, as though somehow or other something precious has been lost by focusing on the context rather than on the transaction between the user and the knowledge, which is predefined for that user by catalog systems. I mean, it's funny, given the, the growth of cultural studies yeah. in the past 30 years, you would think it would be, you know, the idea would be the entire package matters as opposed to simply the the you know, the data. This sounds to me like a penny waiting to drop. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe the penny is dropping through the various um, um, pinball machines of the academic world. Who knows? I don't much care. Um, the immediate sense I have is that libraries, that archive libraries in my field, which is fantastic as a whole, are under increased pressure to go the other direction, to have their 
holdings assimilated into the larger context of the institution that supports them. And that, to my mind, is, is, is although understandable, it's deadly for me, and I want to transgress it as aggressively as possible in, in any library I present, any arguments I make about fantastic, uh, any, anything I write, any, anything I represent is ultimately transgressive of the making fungible of knowledge. Yeah, you, um, during a panel yesterday, you were peeved at a, a academic text coming out of Wesleyan University that chose to um, cite an out-of-date print edition of your science fiction encyclopedia rather than the ongoing organic... If they're going to bother version. citing it, they should probably cite the, the, the version that's version. four times as long as the out-of-date version from 1993 with a tiny addendum in 1999 that they cited in a paper back edition. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And it was also tied to the fact that um, I have my own amour propre and on my own career, my own 50-odd years of conducting whatever I conduct intellectually, cognitively, um, or with passion, or about passion, basically through things which are labeled book reviews. Although most of them are not book reviews in the normal sense. But academic scholars that the Wesleyan University Press tends to print will not touch that stuff. Whether or not it's any good, that's not the point. They won't touch it a priori. And it's the a priori which I find deeply offensive. I find it less offensive that somebody is offended by me than, <laughs> than that, or, or finds me useless, than that they will not look because they are following um, like um, rats in a cage, a particular path towards the whatever rats eat, which is usually crap or tenure. It, tenure it, crap, if it, you want. In New York, it's pizza, but, but yeah, go on. okay, <laughs> tenure pizza. <laughs> not very. It's not very flavored, yeah. and there's a there's and there's a lot of paperwork involved in getting a bite. Yeah. But call it tenure pizza. <laughs> Where did the encyclopedic impulse begin for you? I studied encyclopedic novel because uh, back in college because it was a way of uh, reading bigger books and everybody else and intimidating them. But uh, for someone who doesn't have quite that that sense of um, being an asshole like me, um, where did it start for you in terms of probably circumstantially that the difference between a, a person who is trying to change himself from an accumulator of books and from a ad hoc reviewer of of individual books um, plunging into the into the unknown in a context which may not have too much um, reach or grasp of of the rest of the world. It was it was circumstantial. Peter Nichols in 1975 asked me to join him in an enterprise which was became the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, and it, it like it gelled. That's what I'm wondering. Did, did you was it that moment of holy shit? This is what I should have been doing, or this is how I already see that. the world and needed to. Yeah. Slower than that. Yeah. Not, it's easy to retrofit. So you yeah. sort of fell that, into that kind, that, kind, your, yeah. that kind of suffragette passion, but I, <laughs> I didn't have it then. It seemed to be, it seemed to be something that could be um, a job, and an, an engaging job. It only gradually became something that integrated with the books I was collecting and the arguments I would be making in, in various contexts, in, in books of essays or reviews or my own collections, which always, as it were, intensify the arguments that were first made, although I've tried very hard over the years not to, as it were, retrofit wisdom in, into those, those pieces. They are locked in time to a certain degree, just the way I hope my books and the books I collect and the books I write are. I'm, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not pretending to think that retrofitting, which seems to be a little bit similar to making fungible um, act, um, assaults on various forms of knowledge, it seems to be the same kind of abstract of, of process that, uh, that, that destroys the original flavor, the original context, as I was saying earlier, of the thing itself, of the, 
of, there of the was word. A teleology of, yeah. of Clute. That, yeah. you know, yeah, everything yeah, led yeah, to this yeah. point. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. it's bullshit. There is none. Yeah. There, there's an accumulation of things which can be retrofitted into a teleology. Mm -hmm. But most of our lives, as we tell stories all the time, are accumulation of crap which we can make teleological yeah. and recover. Now, you use accumulation in a different term, or a different yeah. format there, but yeah. the difference between being a collector and an accumulator of books? An accumulator of books, one probably doesn't catalog what he or she. I'll say he because it's always until guy. recently, it's it's been so frequently guys, not always, but might as well call them he because it also characterizes the kind of person who does collect, which tends to be geekish and probably bachelor like, not so much collect as accumulate. Accumulators um, are more interested in in piling up the material and and having a sense of of plenitude from having more than they know and not actually in any real detail knowing what they have. Mm -hmm. That it's it's a kind of anxiety um, 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 releaser, I think, uh, accumulating. I think it's a, it, it, tends, it tends to move into um, psychological territory. Have we not been talking? We were not on this one, but the backup was working fine, so we're still good. Um, okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, the bars are moving, and I realize the timer itself was backwards not moving, in the so. future, like F. Scott Fitzgerald writing that great <laughs> sentence. Here we go. Two thousand and seventeen. Well, one of my fantastic devices is not actually working right now. I'm a science fiction guy, you know. I can't make these things work. That was trust me when I recorded with Scott McCloud. Uh, we had problems with the cables themselves, and the great thing about McLeod being such a tech geek was that he's perfectly fine with stuff not working. <laughs> Somebody who's less sophisticated thinks these things work perfectly every single time. Scott was like, "Oh, don't worry, your backup is going okay, and we'll we'll figure out that what's wrong with the, the cables on the yeah, main yeah. one, and you know, we got it yeah. all fitting." Yeah, it's a good it's a good line. Yeah, yeah. for him. Yeah, <laughs> there are instances where right. I'm just a complete fuck up, so yeah. it's it's Whatever. not a problem at all. But you know. <clears throat> well, give me a chance to okay, accumulators, collectors. I kind of think of a collector as someone who is a bit more like a gardener than somebody who just buys books. I've, I've, I've used the phrase before, but it's very, very obvious. Collectors are gar like gardeners in the same senses that they do a lot of murdering. They call books. Mm -hmm. They decide which book will be acquired, which book is not wanted on the journey. They probably, like me, catalog their books so that they know what they are. They can go too far, of course, and end up with you know, very, very, very specialized lists of books which turn out to be uh, lonely, not, not, not really very interesting in a larger cultural sense. But a, a good collector is trying to create a library which in some sense models the world that that library refers to. It's a it's a it's a it's a symbolic iconic um, structuring of the world. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself making a transition from accumulator to collector? And is that yeah, something that I people think, tend to go through? I th I think most people who are can be designated as correct as collectors, as I've been describing them, probably started just accumulating books. Like, mm -hmm. how do you how do you learn how to collect unless you have something to yeah, As it were. That's what I wonder if it's a. You that, can't begin to collect until you can begin to murder. You're not a curator. You can't, you can't murder a... until you've got stuff to murder. <laughs> Another way of putting it. Good. <laughs> so I've, I've probably started transforming it slowly mm -hmm. into something that, that had more shape and had more argument to it around the mid 1970s when I was in my 30s. It, it isn't something that for me came particularly quickly. Dictated by space constraints, or a uh, again, well, or was more a more thematic move in the mid nineteen seventies, in which everything got moved to one place and everything had to be moved back. At the point where everything had to be moved back, I made a decision about what should be. That's what I wonder. You know, uh, yeah, were there circumstances yeah. there that led to the? You know, this is. I really need to start systematizing this and figure yeah, out what yeah. needs. Uh... I'd, I'd love to be a lonely thinker in the tower, surrounded by books, and have it magically happen. But no, it happens through circumstance. And if you're lucky enough, you you benefit from the circumstance. And mm -hmm. I realized that probably four or five thousand books, and maybe more, were just not wanted on journey. They were they were there because I'd bought them. Yeah, do you remember uh, 
a criteria, I guess. You know, what was the, oh, well, you know... A, the, a basic underlying criteria of my collecting, certainly with regard to anything that was central, was it had to be a first edition. Okay, so that's the first that step. Was, that, yeah. was a, that was a very, very um, eloquently concise yeah. way of handling a lot of material. A lot of it just got discarded because it was costing more to retain than I could possibly benefit financially from it. That is an underlying um, premise that most collectors who are not multimillionaires have to argue to themselves. Are they building a legacy of kipple for their heirs, or are they actually enjoying a, um, an organized and more and more organized life that may not completely scupper those heirs when they kick the bucket. Part of the reason that I sold the um, science fiction library to um, the institute that's been, as it were, evolved to hold it in Telluride was that this would mean that 12,000 volumes that were organized but could be dissolved if ignorant people laid hands on it, that 12,000 volumes could be removed from risk, yeah. family risk, the, the risk of biology, of aging, of death. And that was very important to me. Yeah, I'm sort of visualizing the um, the seed libraries in uh, uh, Sweden and Russia with uh, the, the primal stock seeds that they try to, to yeah. save for doomsday because yeah. when doomsday hits right, rather right. than just having a canticle for Leibowitz we should have all the books about canticle for I'm just kidding uh. <laughs> but in a sense you're just kidding yes I, I described when I saw the um, uh, the brochure that John Lipton Zolin had just recently generated just in time in, a, in essence for me to um, give my address within, within a context in Tiger right? I thought of immediately as the kind of library that a generation starship might have. Yeah. Especially since it had non institutional lighting in the, in the computer rendering and in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, at least one person has objected online to the thought that it's not bright enough. The computer rendering shows a yeah. library which is not bright enough, which sounds like somebody is as it were, in the, caught in the entrails of fungible transactions. <laughs> it needs to be bright so you can see what you're actually extracting. Well, I want an ambience. Yeah. I also want lights bright enough to read by, obviously. Of course. But institutional lighting seems to be a lighting all, which represents transaction, represents frozen transaction rather than frozen being. Mm -hmm. And those... and. Those transactions are, of course, vital to our civilization, but they're not the only thing that happens. And they're obviously, in an age of digitalization, every digitalized text has been treated as though that which is digitalized is all that can be said. And, of course, it's not. Yeah. And that particular, that particular dynamic, which is so powerful in our world, is something I'm trying to prevent occurring in in the in the library that I've um, sold to the um, to, to Telluride. Mm -hmm. if we don't do it. We don't. You, you don't. You don't lose. Well, I, I get, I'll, I'll interrupt myself. I devised a kind of term which is stolen from various sources to describe the, what happens between the thing itself, and the representation of the thing itself, which claims to be the thing itself. What happens is that something something is lost, and I called it the prestige. Yeah, yeah. We discussed that in our, our I think, our first conversation. Oh, did we was that long ago? Yeah, when you were oh, first planning. And, and as we get person. older, we oh. think our old thoughts are new thoughts. It's so terrible. <laughs> but it's one you've been working through. It's one, where I've one been working through, and it's, yeah. it's embedded in this. Yeah. That, that an archival library which is visual, which is first editions, which has dust jackets, which is there, which can be touched and has to be touched to be understood, can retains the prestige. Hmm. It's, it's interesting to me, um, within our world of, of friends, I recorded with Samuel Delaney a few months ago, mm -hmm. and he's essentially lost most of his library. 
uh, because of so, yeah. yeah, because of uh, uh, just moves space, et cetera, and is uh, it's, uh, d- treating it and and has said this on tape that it's like lobotomization for him that he doesn't have access to parts of his mind that were externalized into this this yeah. library. Yeah. Um, are there things that you put into this collection to tell your eye that you sort of wish you were holding on to, or is there a parallel clue to, uh, personal library that's that's still? Well, there are a couple of answers. Yeah. Uh, there is always something that is lost if you if you divest yourself of something that has been part of your mm-hmm. understanding of the world and of yourself, and and that you have been touching. There's always something lost, but the losses seem minimal here. My personal connection to the library remains. Mm-hmm. Um, not an ownership connection, but um, I have very considerable say in how it's being done, how it has evolved, and I'll be visiting there fairly frequently, probably to do the occasional talk, maybe eventually set up roundtable situations, conferences when we have the the full structure built. It's an integrated structure that is now um, awaiting a couple of of, of a, as were legal um, um, enablements for the for the build to begin, but the build is um, competently, um, as it were, um, embedded in in financial and in architectural possibilities. So it's not going to cost too much to get about four thousand feet of conference space and Telluride Institute space and library space. Um, into into an, into an, a context which welcomes it, mm-hmm. um, but but that sense of externalizing back, yourself into a, yeah. So that that I feel I feel I'm 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 sort of externalized there. So there is a vicarious and sometimes actual connection with 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 the stuff. The other fact is it's science fiction, and for the last forty years I've been doing science fiction in an in an encyclopedic fashion in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction. And most of those books have been gone through one way or another. They've been, they've been looked at. They've been entered into the encyclopedia. They've been checklisted. And in recent years, all that have been scannable have been scanned. Mm-hmm. So that I mean, the, the covers. Sorry, yeah, not the books themselves. They've been. You're no Google Books. That's, there are no that's, Google Books. Yeah. So we're, we're not. We're not sneaking back a, yeah. a post prestige version of abstract yeah. version of the text. No. The, but the covers have been scanned mm-hmm. and properly captioned and located. I am kind of happy personally that I didn't realize um, two or three years ago that what I should have really been doing was scanning not only the covers but the flap copy in the back as well. Yeah. But I would, I would probably be dead by now from the exhaustion. <laughs> it's not. It's a laborious, hands-on process scanning a, the exact cover that you that you mean to for that edition. Be, um, Descriptive of the of the book as 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 employed as deployed in the encyclopedia and identifiable in the library as well as the cover, not a facsimile of that cover, not a not a Photoshop of that cover, not a cover that we bring down from somewhere else, hoping it will be the right one. Yeah. So this all all takes a time. It's basically done now. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, yeah, I've, I've I've certainly lost them, but a lot of the context remains. It's all it's all I, f- I feel a kind of vicarious touch with all with all of that. And you retain the the personal and the personal collection, collection. yeah. And there's personal collection, a large personal collection, which is not science fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's poetry, it's literature, it's this, it's that, and it's voluminous enough. And a bunch of Clive James books in the the kitchen, as I remember. Yeah, Clive so. James books in the kitchen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little about the the speech you gave as the the opening? I haven't had a chance to watch it yet because no one will leave me alone here at ReaderCon because I'm so fascinating. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I just know how to you, attract fascinating it, people. Like, yeah. You're one of those very unusual people who volunteers to do what you're doing and also knows what you're doing mm-hmm. technically, and also you read the material. I mean, it's I it's like you're like catnip. Except for Appleseed, uh, so, you know, I, I still feel bad that I sat down with you without reading your your first or your second novel, which somebody brought out. Uh, to, actually, that's a question uh, that that came up when I was yeah. sitting around at breakfast this morning. Um, your the one novel you have in the U.S. is uh, Appleseed, but there yeah. was a 
UK novel called The Disinheriting Party this that came true. out from some small press. Allison and Busby. Which sounds like a vaudeville act. Um, but someone asked, is there any um, any thought about republishing that? Or there, there is none. None whatsoever. Okay. No, I don't, I don't think I'm... This could be a little like my Harold Bloom moment where he blanched when I showed him a copy of a voyage, uh, 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 The Flight to Lucifer, his one novel. Um, my novel isn't that bad. Oh, good. Okay. And he, <laughs> he said... I don't regret writing it. I do regret publishing it. That was. <laughs> that was I, I, I don't actually regret publishing it. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> but I not don't, something you. Um, if somebody wants to do an ebook, that's fine. But I'm not going to go into the process of, of, of republishing it as a physical object that that lumbers mm -hmm. the world. No. It's, you work on fiction at all, or again, I assume the encyclopedia and other nonfiction work takes up. I and, would uh, I would work on fiction if I had the really burning impulse to do so. But I cannot write fiction unless I, I have a hook. If I can't create a hook for myself, then I get into OCD recursivenesses of revision and revision and never get anywhere. It's happened time and time again over the last, well, it must be 60 years now since I started trying to write fiction. Mm -hmm. And if I don't get a hook, I can't do it. And the Appleseed, which I may have said last time we talked about this sort of thing, the hook of Appleseed is that a few years earlier, Paul Barnett and I were friends. He had gotten a contract with a computer game named Elite to write some novelizations. And I did a synopsis for a, for a story about, about solitary... Um, Traders, entrepreneurs in the stars, and I used that synopsis as a hook to write something that is pretty radically different from that. But if you want to trace back, you can see all these places where yeah. I knew I had to, I, I had to, I had to continue because I had something to continue with. But if I don't have that, I'm, I'm obviously I'm not a natural fiction writer. I'm not a natural storyteller. Sure. Mm -hmm. And seeing yourself fictionalized in other people's works has that come up? Have you been a character? Uh, at least a veiled character in a... I think veiled or referred to. I don't think I. I don't think there's a Romana Clay version of me in any anybody's novels. I don't think. I. I know I've. I've, I've appeared a few times, but basically just as a as a kind of a citation. Okay, so you don't get you know murdered uh, in in people's stories the way not that you know, I remember, publishers. But I'm not very good at remembering that sort of thing. Oh, okay. I, I figured you might you know catalog that sort of stuff and, and yeah. hold grudges no, the way people not. here no, in the no, field I, do. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, that first novel had a lot of Romana play element in it. Mm -hmm. it did. And there were some possibly fairly savage portraits of various people, much disguised. But anybody who knew. All the people I knew closely between 1965 and 1973 or 74, the, the novel was finished uh, several years before it published, would be able to you know, yeah. work out that. Uh, John that, really had it in for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, the stories I've written, um, most of them have romantically elements. That's, that's, I guess that's a hook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, your relationship with Telluride prior to this, what led to the either the offer from them or uh, uh, well, there's a there's a kind of family history there in a way because um, Pamela Zolin, who wrote Heat Death of the Universe in 1967, um, and I uh, met in 1957 and in high school, and off and on lived together for three or four years into in in New York for two or three years. Two or three years, at least, in New York, we lived together, and then we eventually um, split up and became really, really good friends, yeah. as it were. And at that time, we we lived, we shared an apartment with um, Thomas M. Dish, Tom Dish, mm -hmm. for for a year. And much of that material um, shows in novels like The Disinheriting Party, but not, but so. Unpacked and changed, processed, and yeah. yeah, more of it shows in the unpublished and not to be published first novel I wrote, which was during that time and was accepted for publication by Mike Moorcock for a publisher called Robertson Vintner in the UK, and I'm I think I'm probably very very lucky that it that it, that the publisher folded. 
Would have ruined your reputation or just given well, you a have a reputation, but wouldn't have helped make it. <laughs> yeah, what would have left you at a, a, a disadvantage would, going it, forward. I would, it would have been the sort of thing I would have been deeply embarrassed by because of its technical incompetence. Mm -hmm. F points. It gained competence as I wrote, but I was too much of a shit to accept anybody's advice as to how to fix the first half so that it, that it um, as it were, mirrored the competence. moderate technical competence of the second half. Gotcha. And a new nonfiction work or collection coming out? Um, not immediately. I'm not writing. In preparation, according to. Yes, uh, it is in preparation. Uh, okay. I've yeah. got maybe. I've not determined exactly what I'm going to put into it, but certainly the the columns and essays I've done for the last, I guess, three, four, five years are all accumulating. They're, they're pretty close to a fairly short book now. Mm -hmm. I don't write them as frequently now. I'm, the encyclopedia has kind of taken over in a way and some of the essays that I would write are actual essays in the encyclopedia yeah. as as it gets larger Excerpted I, feel and freer freer to, too. I yeah. feel freer to have entries which are which are more like essays more like arguments than traditional science fiction entries would be mm -hmm. um, I'm drifting into the encyclopedia but the encyclopedia is, is now full of what you might call Easter eggs mm -hmm. all sorts of little bits of fun in the five million four hundred thousand words, it may not be that easy to find those bits, but I don't want them to be easily found. I don't want a file of Easter eggs where I try to say transgressive things under my breath. <laughs> but there, there, there are some entries which are conspicuously argumentative. Um, a mysterious stranger, uh, ruins and futurity. Ruins and futurity is an entry I'm, I'm actually pretty proud of. It. Mm -hmm. it it argues the points at which one can begin to understand how science fiction becomes recognizable to us, how, the, how we get the feel of it. And it doesn't happen, in terms of that argument, it doesn't happen until the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. When, in terms of that argument, which I'm compressing madly, um, um, all of a sudden it became possible for writers to perceive that there was a vacuum between now and the future which had to be narrated. And that vacuum was created by a runes of futurity um, visual model which was itself created at the end of the 19th century by a couple of painters, Robert Hubert or Hubert Robert, I can never remember his name, yeah. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the entry, painted this extraordinary painting in, 19, in 1796, of the Louvre, which was freshly constructed. It's, it's a double, it's a diptych. There is the Louvre, and there is the Louvre in ruins with an observer. And that is, as far as I can tell, the first time in world history that there is a ruin of the future, of the, set in the future of something which is not a ruin now, mm -hmm. and also with an observer. If there's an observer, he has to be able to tell the tale. And the tale is science fiction, as it were. Sir John Soane, who designed the um, Bank of England and was a great collector, and who lived from 1760 or 65 till into the 1830s, he had a long life, um, had his tame artist paint ruins and futurity paintings of the home he was building and the Brit the Bank of England itself. It's a very famous painting. It's it's the Bank of England, which was just being constructed in ruins. Yeah. And in something like 1810, 1812, he wrote a manuscript which wasn't published until 1979, a kind of of Archaeology of the archaeologists of the future views a building being constructed in 1810 and cannot work out what in the world it's all about. And that became, though not on the basis of that story, but there have been dozens of stories. Archaeologists in the future mis mystified by the ruins of New York, the, the Hotel of the, of the Mysteries by um, Macaulay, um, the archaeologists of the future examining a motel and treating the, the toilet as the as the the central shrine 
<laughs> because the past, which is us, is is so difficult to narrate from a future point of yeah. view. Yes. So all of that happens then, and that was that's in the encyclopedia, mm -hmm. and that's speculative. It doesn't belong in an encyclopedia in the sense, except that I that I source it with plenty of links to suggestive and maybe fairly strong. Um, Parallel, coordinated entries that 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 are consistent with this argument. Yeah. So that's 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 where that comes. That appears. I'm not writing as many, many many reviews now. Mm -hmm. The new one, Inherent Gaze, will be out in a year or so, I guess. The new collection, and maybe I'll put in some of the film entries from the encyclopedia because they're people they're love highly movies. argumentative as well. Yeah. And if you talk about Star Wars, everybody will read it. So. Well, I do talk about Galaxy Quest. Which is the greatest Star Trek movie ever, yeah, it's, it's, hands down. It, uh, the, we had a really great panel yesterday, which was about extraterrestrial art, and we went into um, the image of of an extraterrestrial species, which was incapable of understanding Art as a lie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 trust me, I, I'm not even being facetious. Yeah. Outside of Wrath of Khan, Galaxy Quest is easily the, the best Star Trek it yeah. is. Yeah. It is. It is really. It's. 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 It's fun to watch, but it is so full of content that you can talk about. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. something. Um, as long as we talk about ruins and futurity, do you think about succession? Do you think about what happens after you're gone? Yeah, the, we. I have at least one colleague whom I want to um, take over mm -hmm. from what what I do. But what I do is. Now becoming so as I don't say esoteric, but, modified by yeah. from the 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 decades of as it were being behind the eight ball because it was never completed. It never will be completed, but there is now, as of the last couple of months, there it is a uniformitarian degree of incompletion throughout. I'm with you. As uh, it were. Uh, do you think it's a case the... There are no particular gaps. Yeah, the groundwork is complete the, in that respect. The, like there's the entry basic, structure, yeah. the entries, the author entries, which are the more, by far the most numerous, they're all complete according to a description. Yeah. And that description is not a bad description. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not itself complete. And every time I walk into a dealer's room, I see a book I don't have an entry on. I don't have an entry for the author. Obviously. Never be complete, but but there is a uniform degree of incompletion. Yeah, I get you. I, I just wonder in those yeah. terms, because all I think about is death. Um, you know what what comes after if you're not Scott Edelman and you have a zombie on your trail? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I would I would I would not be unhappy to see it. Um, I don't I don't foresee ret retiring in the immediate future. There's no need to. Not until the mind goes or the body goes or. Mm -hmm. Or death hits. Uh, it's the job is not as heavy as it was, and in a sense, is more interesting. I want to have have the fun of now doing the various forms of knitting. That's what I wonder: is the essayistic aspect of it I'm doing, that, I'm, that stage two? I'm doing a few is, more um, yeah. theme entries, which are more like motif entries because mm -hmm. I'm not very good at themes like biology. So I'll leave that to people who can understand that sort of thing and can exposit it. So I'm doing more of that sort of thing and and creating the Easter eggs, which is not an, as just an indulgence. It's also it's also creating, um, I hope, a reason for people to actually look at the encyclopedia and follow the links because they may find surprises there. Yeah. I always go with Pale Fire with the uh, the, the the family jewels and in the index in, in Pale Fire. Yes, uh, it's it's yes, you know sending yes. you around all over the damn place. Yes, but exactly. exactly. <laughs> so how's ReaderCon been this time around? A ReaderCon's been fine. You know there are, there are a lot of people who seem to have a resentment that ReaderCon, in any sense whatsoever, reflects the fact that decades have passed since the first ReaderCon. There's, there are Once again, succession, mortality, death. Yeah, succession, yeah. mortality, and there are changes in the program structure so that there's, there are more special interest discourse, um, how, to, how to feel safe while writing kind of, end of panels, which don't interest me too much, but which have an entirely valid um, 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 remit, Attract audiences, attract attract a buzz. I've noticed that ReaderCon has this year 
and I think last year too, had a very, very welcome increase in the number of younger people. Ritacom was beginning to be, as it were, um, was aging about the, the, every year that passed, it was, everybody was a year older, and that's, mm -hmm. that's not the case now. Uh, as I say, some, some people find it difficult because it feels like a secure um, arc is becoming a, you know, a battleship of some sort. Mm -hmm. But I think, or an airship, aircraft carrier, whatever, the image, the image needs yeah. evolving, but it's, that arc is no longer, um, as it were, leak-proof. And, but those leaks are not necessarily destructive. In fact, they're not at all, I think. Mm -hmm. So Redicon this year was fine, and for me personally, it was absolutely fine. There were some very good panels. Yeah. Yeah, before you came into the Fiction Mag's listserv panel um, mm -hmm. that, that you were on, I think they, they spoke a little about the lack of a sense of history among younger writers, which seems to be a common complaint of older writers. Um. <laughs> older writers think a lack of history, a lack of history and not paying attention to me is exactly the same thing. <laughs> and in it, in it is, it is it's certainly the case that, that um, younger, younger writers and readers have a very, very different background. And they're not necessarily going to have the automatic, it's not knee-jerk, but it's, you know, like it's a, the... I'm a, I'm a frog. I'm get I get galvanized by the name of Heinlein, but not all the frogs out there are galvanized by the name of Heinlein. And it's and there is some sense of a, a loss of history, but that's not that's not Readercon. That's that's the, that's the world we are we are occupying, where everything is available in a horizontal way, but but in depth depth does not really exist for many people. Mm -hmm. Chronological depth, the sense of time. A mile wide and an inch deep. Sorry, a mile yeah. wide but an inch yeah. deep. That's and it's yeah. and we're not going to, as it were, radically prevent that from happening at ReaderCon. Although there are, there are plenty of panels, plenty of people, plenty of action which represent a continuity. It's a refusal to think that anything really significant happened after magazines faded away thirty years ago, whenever that characterizes some of the folk maybe it maybe at fiction mags mm -hmm. which is a um as it were revanchist organization <laughs> underneath its <laughs> underneath its some um, amiable exterior mm -hmm. now i had gordon van gelder on yesterday so we have to say magazine maybe magazine singular are, are still going along but <laughs> gordon is an absolute hero of our times I am not going to speak about Gordon yeah. as a prophetic economic <laughs> acumen. He keeps FNSF going. That's, he does. That's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's quite extraordinary. He's a, he's a genius at doing it. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was, it was a, it was a defiant gesture, yeah. even back on what over twenty years ago. Yeah. yeah, we talked a bit about um, my own experience within the trade magazine, uh, business to business magazine world, and how the economics of that whole structure have changed over the decades mm -hmm. and how one has to adapt and um, not having a textbook for the transition to online is uh, you've, you've pursued it in your own way, I guess with the encyclopedia in terms of understanding th that online could be an opportunity and not simply a, you know, a selling point for a print edition of something. Yeah. I wouldn't describe the encyclopedia as something nowadays, which has, Anything but it became um, its own legacy resemblance to yeah. its to its preceding editions. The text is has similarities, but the text is now presented in a radically different way. Obviously, yeah. with links and with an expanded form, and it's 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 also an admission, a, a proclamation, really. From I think it was about the year two thousand that I was made the first proposal for a third edition, and that proposal indicated that it had to be online. Yeah. that there was there was no real um realistic or useful um future for a a, a text based reference book and yeah. and we held to that and there's never been any hint whatsoever every once in a while somebody comes up with i'd really love to see it in print like yeah go go find uh go find know. the five hundred thousand dollars and the person who wants to spend 
all that money and time making a 10 volume encyclopedia which is going to be obsolete in a week yeah and you can't link out to and you can't link or in. link out for you it. can't link in you're no internal links and you certainly can't link out yeah no it's yeah. one of those I, I have a, a kindle edition of david thompson's uh, encyclopedia of film and oh, yeah. sadly it was it's it's just text like there's no a table of contents where you could at least jump from one entry to another. You have to basically search for the the person you want to leap to, and it's like this is really this is just putting in electronic form of yeah an un, 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 unaltered. Where some of these works well, we really start, should start be the third, third edition, yeah. um, basically not obviously not 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 a new because there was so much text already. There was a million and a half words of of text that had to be assimilated and and transformed, but. We did it in the understanding, the full understanding that what we what we did had to be had to be had to be online, had to manip be manipulable. The mm -hmm. the online site now is perhaps a bit archaic, and, and a lot of it could be changed relatively easily. And we're hoping to to as, as it were clarify some of the critical pathing of the actual site itself. But that, to me, is relatively superficial. Yeah. User uh, interface stuff as opposed to the, content based. I think so. The the encyclopedia will re, re, remain um, hugely text based, vastly text based. It's it is unusual, obviously, in in online enterprises that you're always the text is the heart of it. No, we should be video. I'm just kidding. That's, I know you're kidding, but yeah. it's such a <laughs> tempting idea. Well, well it's it's perhaps, within. Perhaps we could read it aloud. Yeah. We do a podcast. Naked. Oh God. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's that's. Uh, people don't even know that we're both naked, right? No, no they don't know that because this is a primitive, <laughs> primitive kind of thing. You've got these backups, but you don't have the proper video. I'm just a barbarian. I, yeah, I tell you, yeah. it's um. There was a shut a, up over there. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, keep doing that. Yeah. Ooh, hey, the uh, uh, Fox Sports. Um, Sorry, website. I was distracted. What? Yeah. Uh, Fox Sports' website, they were trying to compete with ESPN.com, and we're going to get all these great journalists and writers to do these. And it's turned into, yeah, we want to do everything with video now. And so we're getting rid of all the writers. We're just going to do uh, video stories because that's what we can sell ads yeah. in. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, again, it becomes one of those things where the money simply defines what the content is, is supposed to be. Right. And, uh, again, it's admirable that the SFE just doesn't... The, the text itself yeah. is 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 visually autonomous, yeah, and it, remain, and, and it should remain that way. There should be no pop ups. Yeah. So trends in SF, anything weird, or do you are you able to to stay a top? No, no, no. That sort stay of. A, on top of a sinking ship because it's actually something you you should be learning to swim rather than <laughs> cling. <laughs> And I think for me, swimming is to more and more apply the the notion of fantastic, which I think we've talked about in yeah. previous um, encounters. The only thing I can add is that um, using my term, which is stolen, which is or taken, appropriated, and then radically modified by me as an insipid, there is now a journal called Fantastica Journal, which is online. And it has a long piece by me, an initial piece, laying out in more detail than, than I had previously some of the some of the ways in which I understand how fantastic can work as a critical tool, as an in, as an enabling device to envision a set of fields which it is no longer appropriate to try to fix down with labels like science fiction. A science fiction story now is a, a story which has a significant number of aspects that are science fiction-like in it, yeah. which is not the same thing as we started. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much, I'm very eager to gradually, um, without being revolutionary, without upsetting any apple carts internally in terms of how the bloody thing is written and, and presented, gradually move our understanding of what was originally and is not uh, the, the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, which is now a legacy title. It's a, it's a trademark. That's what we're identified as. Yeah. But neither David Langford nor I nor any of the other people, two or three people who are intimately involved, really think it is 
an encyclopedia of science fiction as previously defined. Yeah. Else we'd be crazy. We, we, we'd just be Luddites. We would, might as well just sort of resign and spend all our time on fiction mags. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we're not doing that. We're not going to call it Encyclopedia Fantastic because that's not yet a word. It may eventually become a word which is generally used. The, the fact there's now a journal called that which only has a, as it were, an initial relationship to me is good. And the fact that the term appears now quite often, if you Google it, which I did six months ago, so I don't do it very often, um, appears quite frequently in contexts which are which are obviously within the frame of what I've been describing, but don't mention me at all. And that's that means to me that's a, a word of that I can use fairly freely. I don't have to say my my use of the word fantastic, which I took from Czech literature in nine, 2007, um, says suggests this. I can just say fantastic. Uh, and the little because registered trademark because, sign next to it. And, be, yeah. yeah, because there's no trademark sign. There's absolutely none yeah. because it was stolen. Yeah. Uh, and also because it is it is something which, I mean, there are, there, I, I put on my own turn with the expanded definition or description in, in Fantastica Journal, but basically a lot of it is relatively uncontroversial. It's just an underlying premise that that it is a good idea to, refocus our definitional um, ardors from trying to lock down individual genres to trying to work out instances of stories which resemble those genres and and how they jostle within the larger um, water margins of, of Fantastica. That seems to me to be uncontroversial. I hope it is, because it seems to be right. Well, it's guys with pitchforks outside, so I'm afraid they're yeah, well, it is. We've it's, hit our hour, you yeah, know. It is ReaderCon. They're coming after us with the torches. And Anyway, John, thanks so much for coming back on the show. And that was John Clute. You can learn more about John at his website, johnclute.co.uk. And Clute is C-L-U-T-E. You should also check out the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction online at sf-encyclopedia.com. It's an amazing resource, and I really hope I get to see that science fiction library at Telluride once it's done. And after we wrapped up, I asked John, so, who are you reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, just like you got to hear Liz's answer this time around, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. You can get access by supporting the show at patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, series of ebooks that someday I will get around to launching, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one during ReaderCon 2017 up in Quincy, Mass. Uh, my day job covered the mileage and tolls because I had a conference in Boston immediately after, but I shelled out for the hotel myself, plus, uh, I think, about 65 bucks for a pass to ReaderCon. So if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, those hotel rooms, equipment, etc., or if you just want to toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod, and you can make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Kevin Katila, John Wendler, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Stephen Nadler, Wallace Wilde Minozzi, Andrew Mason, Greg Tanner, Garrett Zecker, Craig P. Steffen, Jack Lescamella, and Ron Slate for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with return guest Mimi Pond, who has a brand new book out from Drawn and Quarterly, The Customer is Always Wrong. 
and she will become the latest member of the three-timer club till next time you can subscribe to the virtual memory show and download past episodes at the itunes store or at soundcloud.com slash vms pod you can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites vmspod.com or the more comprehensive chimeraobscura.com slash vm you can also follow the virtual memory show on twitter and instagram at vms pod on facebook at facebook.com slash virtual memory show at virtual memories podcast.tumblr.com and at youtube by searching for virtual memories show and if you like this show please go to itunes Look up the Virtual Memories Show and leave a rating and review for this podcast. That'll help us build a bigger audience. And until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Mm-hmm.